Greetings, Kai Hagen here with another in a series of uh, video podcasts with folks in our community about a range of different issues. I'll just make a quick note to say this is the first one of what, five or six, seven, um, that is not going to have a pandemic focus. Um, you know, throughout all of this time and COVID-19, of course, climate change hasn't been getting quite as much attention. A lot of things haven't been getting as much attention, but it is as critical, important an issue locally, nationally, globally, uh, as it ever has been. That's a very serious problem. And in Frederick County, we're trying to do what we can on different fronts to address that issue. And one of them is a climate change resolution that's coming in front of the council for a workshop on June 30th. But uh, with that in light, it seemed to be a good time to speak with my guest today. And I'd like to introduce you to Jill Reeves of uh, Joy Reeves. Now see the reason for saying that, and I was about to note is that Jill Reeves and Dave Reeves are a friend of mine that I've met all the way back in the late 90s at a Sierra Club meeting in Frederick. And Joy Reeves uh, is one of their kids, one of their two kids, uh, their daughter, who is a rising junior at Duke University studying environmental science and policy with a minor in visual media studies. Uh, as a trained science communication fellow and member of the Durham Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, she is very interested in climate communication and how it translates into activism, research, and environmental and social justice. She is from uh, Frederick County, uh, grew up near Sugarloaf Mountain, uh, in a lovely house uh, in the countryside, and is currently working remotely in the campaigns department for the League of Conservation Voters. Um, Joy has a book coming up uh, to be published soon, and uh, in fact, they're dealing with a lot of the little details right now, and the people who watch this are gonna get a chance maybe to weigh in and at least see the three of the possible covers for the book. But the title of her book is Growing Up in the Grassroots, finding unity in climate activism across generations. Joy spent the past year conducting research and interviews with young activists from Generation Greta, uh, experienced environmental professionals and grassroots change makers of all ages, even my age since I was one of them, uh, to determine how today's movement is historically and culturally rooted. Her book is about how even in an era of political and generational divisiveness and polarization, uh, the climate movement offers common ground uh, where there is a place for all of us. And if I might add, we need all of us. Uh, so uh, that's going to be very important to some I find uh, particularly interesting and I look forward to talking about it. But before Joy, we launch into talking a little bit about the book and that experience, research, the interviews, why don't you just share a little bit about, uh, you know, the experience of just being a young activist who has gotten really uh, affected by and connected to uh, this issue and motivated to invest the kind of time and effort that you have in the environment and in climate change. Sure. First of all, thank you very much for having me today and having this conversation. Um, on the issue of climate change, I would definitely say that I've been inspired from a young age. And as you mentioned, my parents have a lot to do with it. My dad also started climate activism in his 20s, um, working for the Alaska Lands Coalition, working on bills and passing legislation in Washington, DC. And so my mom is also someone who grew up caring deeply about social justice and the environment so from both of their influence, I've also developed a passion for protecting the earth and the climate. And I think that I started off with more of a science foundation, a foundation in working in a lab. I was studying saltwater intrusion and sea level rise on the coast of North Carolina. And there were so many instances where I felt like I was witnessing climate change through that. Um, we met with some refuge managers at the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, for instance, and they were talking about how the refuge was going to be likely underwater or partially underwater within 50 years. And I could 
kind of see that on their faces, um, that the land that they had devoted their lives to protecting would be compromised. So that really got me interested in climate activism and translating that science background into actionable steps for everyone to get involved in the climate movement. So, you know, that's a problem, as you know, of course, in, in Maryland too, saltwater intrusion and, and rising sea levels, of thousands of miles of coastline with the Chesapeake Bay and, and everything else. So um, you've obviously studying it in school but you've decided to take a particular angle on it in, with an emphasis on sort of communication and messaging. You wanna share a little bit about that? Because that is a big subject. That is, you know, so many people have spent so much time trying to figure out the best and right and most effective ways to talk about this issue, to reach out to people. Um, what motivated you to take that angle on it all? That is a really good question. Um, so. In, as part of the science fellowship that I was working in, I was trained in science communication and I started off not really knowing what that was. You know, I was thinking that scientists research should speak for itself and everybody should understand climate change that way when they have bullet points of data and statistics. That should be enough. Irrefutable, right? <laughs> but there are a lot of instances where the data doesn't necessarily speak for itself and you have to find an intersection between climate science and climate policy and social justice and social well-being of communities so part of what i spent last summer doing was learning how to give testimonies or ted talks or writing op-eds and creating podcasts around the scientific work that is being done on the front of climate change. And that experience was transformative because I realized that when you have an engaged audience that you connect with on a person to person level before presenting the bullet points and statistics, uh, people's minds change and people connect with you on this issue of climate change. And it becomes something that you have in common with your audience. So that was my background in communication. Well, and are you uh, doing things related to that in your current work with the League of Conservation Voters? What's been your emphasis during this summer? Yeah, definitely. Uh, League of Conservation Voters, I'm working for the national mm -hmm. section of LCV instead of one of the state affiliates, although they do work closely with state affiliates. Um, and the Climate Action Program is in four states right now, New Hampshire, Nevada, North Carolina, and Virginia. And so with the Climate Action Program, it's all about communication and organizing. So the organizers put a lot of time into making sure that the events that they plan are inclusive to everyone in the community. And some of it is messaging and storytelling. Um, at a meeting the other day about ethical storytelling in climate change. Um, and so I think, a lot of groups like League of Conservation Voters are striving to communicate in a way that includes everyone, especially now when we realize that racial justice is inexorable from climate justice. Well, and that is actually one of the most interesting sort of possibilities and promises and challenges, I think, in the movement as it has evolved is how to really build on that intersectionality and get people to make you know the connection between the environment and climate and the economy and social justice and racial equity and, and jobs and housing and really i mean it's an ecological model if you think about it because it's based right. on the notion that everything is connected right so so let's let's make sure we leave enough time so we'll move over and talk about your book and your experience um I don't know if you want to repeat the title for people or what it's about just in the context of this discussion, but how did you find your way into that particular, did you decide you wanted to write that or did you decide you wanted to write about climate change and that's where you ended up after you started to kind of look at it a little bit? I was tossing around a few ideas. Um, one of them was more technical focused on solar energy, but I ultimately landed on this idea because I, it was where I realized that I fit into the climate movement. You know, I don't want to speak 
from experience that I don't yet have in um, recognizing my age in the solar industry, for example. And what I realized I did have was enough experience contacting and interviewing and working with people of all ages. And I figured that that was a message that I could share with everyone that um, we, we have so many commonalities in being proud of our national parks or wanting a safe future for children or wanting to create a lot of new jobs. Those are things that most Americans share and have in common. So if I could craft a narrative around that, the title popped into my head randomly one day, I was going for a walk or something and I was just like, ooh, growing up in the grassroots to emphasize that we've all grown up sharing common values at some point um, and working on how to recognize them. That's how the idea popped into my head. Did grow up, as we've sort of alluded to, uh, not only, you know, in and around nature, but with parents who, for whom those were important values and who had chosen at times in their lives to be actively engaged in local environmental organizations and, and things like that. So that's another sort of way of you having grown up with some exposure to that. But the subtitle or the book, I don't know, it's part of the whole title, but Finding Unity in Climate Activism Across Generations, um, that suggests inherently that the need to find unity is there because it has, you know, there are issues, there are problems with uh, generations looking at it differently, maybe connecting differently, framing it differently. Um, that part of the title, what is that really trying to get at? I mean, in other words, finding unity, but what's the, what's the framework or the challenge that makes that worth thinking about? That's a really good question. Um, the story that I use actually to open up my book and kick everything off is OK Boomer. Uh, some of you might know about that. Some of you might not, but it's a My hashtag. friends know they should never post that on my Facebook page. I, I don't. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, OK Boomer is a hashtag that basically is, comes from younger people my age and is saying, you're older and your views are so obsolete that I shouldn't take the time to engage in a conversation with you. So bye, your generation has failed us on the climate and it cuts off the conversation there. And it went viral and a lot of young activists rally behind it or laugh at it and use it as an organizing call. But it's always kind of made me feel uneasy because it's, I, I've met with enough people your age and from members of all generations who have worked in the climate to realize that it hasn't been a failure. It's been building a foundational movement that kicked off really in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and OK Boomer ignores that foundation and all of our opportunities to extrapolate upon that historical progress and just move forward uh, together with mentorship and internships and shadowing and all these opportunities for younger people to keep working with older people. Well, we need all of us, you know, and I think it's interesting when you say, you know, it hasn't been a failure because, you know, there are clearly people uh, older than me, my age, younger than me, across the entire spectrum who have cared about this issue for a long time or who have come to care about it, you know, deeply and sincerely but of course, and there has been progress made, but as you know, as we know, that progress has been woefully inadequate. The problem has still gotten much worse. Uh, we have not solved it. There is reasons for hope in the new generation and new technologies and growing levels of awareness. And in part, because people are actually seeing the problem. We haven't mm -hmm. solved it enough so that what we're facing has become very frightening. Um, but, and I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of young people are sort of connecting with each other and the issue is because it seems so much more real in our day-to-day -day lives now. For someone your age, you know, I mean, you're looking at reading things as Greta Thunberg says, right, that are eight, 10, 12 years away from critical tipping points if we're not at them already. You know, they're talking about really hardcore ambitious goals in 2030, 2040, 2050 that we're not on a course to maintain. So I don't know, it depends how you look at failure, but as collectively, you know, we have not done enough and we're 
we're going to need you know that extra boost to get there right. uh, not a so, total failure but definitely room for growth and an urgent time span to do so very urgent and but in, in the context of your you know lifespan and people who are looking at I mean, what Greta Thunberg talks about how old she'll be in the year 2050 or things like that and it just you know creates a different sort of perspective but what are the best ways that you've found in your interviews and research to identify points of unity and to build that unity that is the focus of your book enough to be in the title? Yeah, so part one of my book talks about the history behind the movement and the foundations of the environmental movement. And part two moves into those commonalities that you mentioned. Um, I devote several chapters to each one is a different theme or topic that is a commonality in um, our values. Some of them are not underestimating the power of local politics, which I'm sure you are familiar with, um, because a sense of place is one of the commonalities that we share. Everyone has a hometown. Everyone has that favorite spot that they would retreat to in their childhood to get away from the craziness of growing up. Um, and whether it be a park or a forest or a region. Uh, a neighborhood. A neighborhood. Uh, research has also found that whether you're living in an urban or rural environment, uh, your level of care about the environment uh, d doesn't necessarily decrease because you're perceived as a rural voter. It has to do with other factors like level of trust in government regulation and things like that. But a lot of people consider themselves environmentalists because they are so tied to their place of origin. And that's one of the powerful commonalities that I touch on. Um, some other ones are being a parent and parenthood and realizing that my generation is panicking because of the, the urgency of climate change. And I interviewed one professor, for instance, who teaches a class in eco grief and climate anxiety. And those are words that we wouldn't have talked about 20, 30, 40 years ago, but now there are entire college classes based yeah. around them. So that's something else that's starting to unite parents is realizing that they have to do this for us, for younger kids. Yeah, and and uh, I like the the notion of place um, as as one of the touchstones or one of the common uh, things that we have. Of course, that's true at any level, right? Writ small and local, home, and the community, neighborhood, planet, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sort of speak. So I know that uh, uh, the book is supposed to come out soon, uh, and you have some things to do before then. And one of them, as I mentioned in the introduction, is uh, pick a eye-catching color that tells the right story and images, and cover uh, that tells the right story and images. And you have three options, or a blend of those that are possible right now. Do you want to take a moment just to share those with us? I think it helps make the book more real, even if we don't know which one is going to be the real cover. Of course, I will share my screen so that everyone can see what I'm working with. Um, these three were created by my cover designers, but they're very iterative. So we're building on them together. They're not in final form yet. And I've been asking for feedback from anyone who wants to give it on favorite covers, things to tweak, things to add or change. So if you like, I'll put the link with the, uh, with the when I upload the video, I'll put a link to that so people can weigh in on the covers. It's perfect. If you, if you want. Yes. I, I I like them all. I think they're all really uh, eye-catching, but as I mentioned to you uh, off the air, so to speak, I, I'm partial to the first one. I don't know. I like, I like the connection between the roots and the people and the title, but they're all, they're all good. So are you, Thank you. are you, uh, do you have a favorite? Well, I put out the survey a few days ago and I still have to go through all the responses, but personally, I was drawn to the middle one. I, I want to avoid sort of eco cliches, like here's the earth, here's the climate, but um, I, I think it's visually engaging. Mm -hmm. It's Although, beautiful. I like the color a lot and the earth is very nice. Thank you. I, I'm still kind of torn. It's a toss up for me because I care so much about what the early readers and people have to say about them. Well, I think it's uh, interesting to have multiple 
options and engage uh, you know some of your future readers with that so um, we will also include a link to anything you have as far as information about the book or where to get in touch with you or how to purchase a copy when it's available but what is the time frame you're expecting right now publication right now is set for the end of july 2020 but um with coronavirus delays and the delays that all of us are experiencing i can't promise it'll be the end of july 2020 but it will be summer 2020. Hmm. well congratulations i mean uh writing a book and getting it published while you're still in college is no small achievement writing a book that i expect will be very uh, engaging and worthwhile about an important subject like this and especially at your age is just remarkable uh, yeah. but we were talking uh, before not during this uh, um, video but uh, about how many uh, remarkable young people especially young women um, are really taking incredible uh, leadership roles and making quite an impact with new organizations, older organizations, just general activism around climate. And I'm guessing, I don't know if you have in mind what your next book might be or your next venture or what you're going to be doing right after school, but something tells me that climate and the environment is uh, uh, going to be uh, a central part of it. What's your 100%. impression? Do you, it's hard to go back now. Um, I can't really picture myself doing anything else or any other issue. And I understand that because when you know that it's as important as it is, how do you not pay attention to it? So um, speaking on behalf of everybody my age and younger and older uh, who cares very deeply about this issue, uh, thank you for making the commitment. Thank you for writing the book. I look forward to reading it. Are Jill and Dave pretty excited about that? I think it's safe to say they're excited too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but uh, uh, we will we will definitely, I will do whatever I can to uh, share some links, uh, not just with the video, but when it comes out so that we can bring it to the attention of folks here in Frederick that one of our own has written uh, an important contribution to this movement. So, are there any other thoughts you might like to share before we uh, sign off? Um, otherwise, just thank you very, very much for joining us for a little while. Thank you. I would just say stay in the climate fight. It's the most important issue that defines my generation and our future. So thank you, Kai, for all the work that you've done. And thank you all, all for listening and engaging on this topic. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure, too. Thank you. Take care, Joy. Bye.